1850, in a small village in the district of Lebisch, Germany, our next incredibly bizarre mystery would take place, because it was this year that a stranger would be spotted wandering around aimlessly along the beach with a confused look on his face, which, considering this was a small area, townsfolk became alarmed and soon got into contact with the authorities who come to speak to him. The man was white and introduced himself as Jofar Voren and spoke an odd and barely understandable dialect of German. When asked about this, he would try to convey he was speaking two languages, Cotabramian and Laxarian, which were not known to exist. He would also tell them his faith was a lot like Christianity. It's then they would question where he was from and the man would tell them he was from Laxaria, a country on the continent of Sacria, which was at the northern part of the world hundreds of miles away from Europe. Jofar had went in search for his brother, who had allegedly been sent to what their people called the New World, which he then pointed to Europe on the map. It was on that journey that the ship would wreck, and that was the last thing he remembered. And obviously, the authorities were stumped, so they would ask this man to indicate on the map what path he had taken to get there, but he was unable to do so. However, he would reveal his race, had considerable geographical knowledge about the five continents called Sacria, Aflar, Astar, Osler, and Eupler. For those of you big into weird stories like this, you'll immediately recognize that it sounds almost identical to the tale of the man from Tored. In that story, a man arrived in Japan in 1954 with a passport issued by the nation of Tored, which didn't exist. But what about our mystery? Well, the authorities here actually had no idea what to do. So they sent him to meet with scholars from Frankfurt who concluded his story was not so crazy and maybe it was even possible. So they wanted to send him to Berlin for further studies. Unfortunately, during the journey, he would have a hysterical fit and jump from the carriage where he would then disappear into the woods and was never found, which leads us to the theories. Of course, one of the big ones has always been that he was some type of interdimensional being and upon fleeing into the forest, he was somehow able to travel back to his own dimension, which would explain why there was never another sign of him. Of course, many think it's just an older version of the Tored story. However, this one does have a more reliable source. According to a German newspaper from October 1851, the man did not jump out into the forest and vanish, and he was never taken to Frankfurt or Berlin to be studied. Instead, he got sent to a Berlin workhouse a place for people who could not support themselves financially. And it was here he would tell the others the same stories about being from some unknown location and speaking in a tongue that no one had ever heard. But he also told even stranger stories, like one of him traveling inside giant birds and warfare that took place in the air, something that would not happen for another 60 years. And as far as that strange language he was speaking, well, it was assumed that this so-called unknown language was really a Slavonic one that was just spoken backwards, giving us the most likely theory that this man had some kind of mental disorder or possibly even amnesia from a very real shipwreck where he suffered head trauma. July 28, 1984, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. 33-year-old Judy Weikert would get up early in the morning to go on a jog through the quiet neighborhood of Surrey Hills. Judy had been training for a marathon and planned to run 16 miles that morning. She had recently even competed in a marathon in Dallas and had won one in Edmonds. She had left the house at 7.30 and usually her husband Steve would go with her, but this morning he decided to sleep in. We only have a vague picture of what happened over the next two hours, but what we do know was that it was tragic because at 9.45 a.m. A woman and her daughter would come across Judy on the side of the road. She'd been left nude to die in a field. The details were awful. She'd been sexually assaulted and stabbed repeatedly, but Judy was tough. And despite being stabbed 23 times in the chest and neck, she would drag herself 50 feet through the field and under a barbed wire fence to get as close to the road as she could. Unfortunately, she had made it to some tall grass, which delayed anyone seeing her for up to an hour. When the mother and daughter pulled over, one would stay with her while the other drove up the road in a hurry to get to a payphone. 
While waiting on an ambulance, Judy would describe her attacker and his vehicle to the woman who was sitting with her. And amazingly, Judy survived until the emergency services reached her. Actually, she even survived the ride to the hospital and then into the operating room, but her body gave out at 1 p.m. The surgeon would tell her family they simply couldn't get enough blood to her. Law enforcement's first response was to issue caution to women jogging alone, and a $5,000 reward was posted for information leading to an arrest, and the police department were actually pretty confident it could be solved quickly. Actually, they assumed like most cases that her husband Steve was responsible, but it didn't take long to rule him out based on Judy's description of the man and vehicle. As well as this taking place right off the highway, it seemed someone would have had to see something. Detectives worked hard on the case for the first year and got several tips from the public, somewhere in the amount of hundreds, but the case went nowhere. By the second year, tips began to slow to a crawl, and the task force was reduced to two detectives, but the task force had used Judy's description to canvas the area the first year of the investigation, and by the start of year two, they had a handful of individuals that fit the suspect. They also interviewed more than 1,000 persons of interest, and more than 350 of these were interviewed under the assumption that they were possibly involved, while 400 of the people interviewed owned a faded blue Volkswagen Beetle, which is what they were pretty sure the suspect had driven. As far as the suspects go, there was a white male in his late 20s to early 30s seen in the area the day of the murder. He was described as being suspicious looking, and he was between 5 foot 10 and 6 foot, with a slender build and muscular arms, long wavy dirty blonde hair with a scraggly beard and a large nose. He was also said to have had a circular tattoo on his left shoulder, which Judy could not make out. Because of the assault, the man had left physical evidence. Testing at the time was limited, but it was found that the man had a rare blood type that was found in less than 1% of white males. Police were excited as they thought this would be just what they needed to get their man. Unfortunately, that was not the case. By spring of 1985, the Oklahoma City Police Department would reach out to the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit to help draw up a psychological profile. This was making history in Oklahoma, as it was the first time this had been requested in the state, which shows the difficult time investigators were having. Detectives assumed it was probably not the suspect's first crime, maybe not even his most recent. They began to widen their scope. Soon, it was learned similar murders had happened in other parts of the country, specifically Pomona, California, Vegas, and Fairfax County, Virginia, murders on both coasts. The victim in Fairfax County, though, had survived, and in this attack, brown hair was recovered, not blonde. Yet detectives were still not ready to rule out that they were connected. However, this is when the investigation would take a frustrating turn, because in 1985, less than a year after Judy's death, another woman in Oklahoma City would walk into her apartment one day only to interrupt a burglar. This man would then stab her and began to sexually assault her before fleeing the scene. The woman amazingly survived, and long story short, a man named Jeffrey Pierce would be charged and convicted for it. In spite of the fact he had several alibis at the time of the assault, detectives in Judy's case would claim that Pierce was responsible for her murder and they stopped investigating it. However, the key testimony in Pierce's case came from a forensic chemist named Joyce Gilchrist, who was eventually found to have falsified evidence in numerous cases over her 21-year career, with 12 of these leading to executions, which is just insane when you consider she never even got a punishment for it. But one of these cases was that of Jeffrey Pierce. In 2001, the conviction was overturned and Pierce was cleared of the assault, which meant for the past 16 years, no one had been investigating Judy's murder. This was just a sloppy investigation all around. February 17, 2004, Yokachi, Japan. A 68-year-old man would go to a nearby shopping center to pick up some things and withdraw money from an ATM. The elderly man had his hands full with shopping bags as he approached the machine. It's near this ATM that a younger woman holding a baby in a chest harness had been hanging around for the previous five minutes. The man would get out his money and turn to walk away, and the woman who had been standing there watching 
would also go to walk off, and bam, she bumped right into him in what seemed to be like a purposeful move. The elder man was taken aback and would be further confused when the woman began rubbing her hands over his body until she found his wallet, and crazily, she made a grab for it and tried to yank it away, which the man was able to stop, but this soon started a tussle for it, one she was not prepared for because she could not wrestle it away from him, but this would not stop her because she quickly grabbed him by the collar and began to scream thief, and you can probably imagine the people turning around to see this old man wrestling over some money with a young woman and baby, well, you can guess who they thought the thief was. Soon, three bystanders, intending to do good, would tackle the man to the floor where they held him as someone called the police. Luckily for them, two officers were already on the scene over a shoplifter. They rushed over and kept the man on the ground while handcuffing him despite his protest. Soon, when things calmed down, everyone watching the events unfold would then notice the woman had vanished, making the story even worse with the two officers refused to let the man up and were actually pretty aggressive considering his age, so much so that he began vomiting and passed out, and the officer still refused to uncuff him. He would take more senior officers arriving on scene who then uncuffed him and called an ambulance, but it was too late. The stress of the situation had caused heart failure, and the man would sadly die. The police the next day who must have been in a hurry, wrote up their file stating the old man, the real victim in all this, died trying to rob a young mother. Thankfully, a few officers thought the whole thing was a bit sketchy. This would be confirmed when they would review the security footage from the area, which revealed the man was indeed the victim. However, finding the woman would prove to be difficult. In fact, it would take over a year later before police finally released photos of her, something they don't do often. But these photos were not the best quality. In fact, one of them, she looks downright disturbing, with those inhumane features leading to the locals calling her the Jusco ATM Phantom, Jusco being the shopping center where it occurred. Of course, waiting that long to release the photo helped very little, as it was unlikely anyone in the area that day was going to remember her, but the police gave a description that she was about 25 to 30 years old, with the baby being 2 to 3 years old. She was most likely Japanese and had a face that was described as unusual. One of the other oddities was the credit cards left at the scene, which she had touched, yet left no fingerprints. But maybe craziest of all, according to the reports, she was not picked up on any cameras as she exited the store. It would take seven years for the police to officially absolve the man of the crime, and eventually, the courts awarded his family for the injustice. But... They never actually put a lot of effort into finding the woman, and her identity remains a mystery to this day, although the statute of limitations have also lapsed. December 21st, 1978. The Kaikoura Mountain Ranges of New Zealand's South Island would play home to our next mystery, because it was this day that a crew on a cargo aircraft would record seeing something strange. That of a series of lights that seemed to be flying with the aircraft. The pilots described it as being the size of a house with five white flashing lights and having many other smaller lights that also flashed. The craft would follow for several minutes before it disappeared and then reappeared somewhere else later. And you're probably thinking, couldn't the pilots just have been seeing stars or planets or something like that? Well, there was one thing that kind of dismissed that. The air traffic controller radar as well as the onboard radar, picked up the objects. But that would not be the end of this weird story, because nine days later, on the 30th, a television crew from Australia set out to film some footage for a special they were going to be doing on the sightings. In what has to be one of the biggest coincidences ever, during the flight there, these unidentified lights would be spotted again, this time by five people on the flight deck, as well as the air traffic controllers, and most importantly, by the film crew, who captured it in color for the television audience. One object followed the aircraft until it got closer to landing, but it wasn't over yet, because after this short stop, the cargo plane with the TV crew would ascend back up into the air, where at around 2,000 feet, it encountered a large bright pear-shaped orb that was reddish in color. And while it looked stationary, the plane's own radar showed that the orb was tracking the aircraft. These would become known 
as the Kaikoura Lights, and they have been spotted sporadically since December 1978. But what exactly are they? Well, the New Zealand Ministry of Defense has, of course, claimed all the sightings can be explained by natural but unusual phenomena. Like first, the sightings were blamed on pilots seeing the planet Venus and mistaken it for an orb following them. But it was later discovered that Venus was not visible that night. So the new theory became that they seen Jupiter, which made even less sense because Jupiter was not visible from the plane those nights. So then a theory was brought up that it was actually an unburned meteorite, which didn't even make sense since one of the sightings lasted for about 15 minutes. After this is when one of the weirdest non-paranormal theories would be suggested. Experts would chime in claiming that squid boats, which are really bright, were having their lights reflecting off of clouds, which is what the pilots really seen. And although that can happen, there's several things wrong with this. First of all, was New Zealand's Air Force investigation found that the nearest squid fleet was over 100 miles away from where the UFOs were seen, dismissing that. But then a report would surface that there was at least one lone squid fishing boat nearby. However, the issue with this is, why didn't the pilots see the boat in the water if it was that bright? Secondly, there have never been any records to show a squid boat was in the area either night that these sightings occurred, which is odd because those boats are legally required to report their locations. Then, there is the big issue of the radar readings, which were seen both by ground crew and the flight crew. Yet, skeptics claim that atmospheric conditions could have caused false radar readings. Others still claim the sightings were drug runners using undocumented planes under the cover of night to make their shipments, or possibly even a secret military training. Then, you got the people who claim the whole thing was a hoax, and of course, it could be real aliens. On a winter morning in 1936, in Pavlodar, Kazakhstan, a 15-year-old girl named E.E. E. Loznaya was walking to school along an isolated path when she would encounter something truly unexplainable. In the sky, she would notice a strange-looking, medium-sized man dressed in black overalls flying. The man, who had his face obscured by a helmet, was wearing an oval-shaped apparatus on his back that looked like a rucksack, but emitted a low rumbling noise. While she marveled at who this man was and how exactly he was flying, he suddenly shifted directions and started flying towards her. Unfortunately, she could not run in the snow, and she began trying to find a place to hide instead. She would look up again to see how close he was, and that's when she realized he had vanished. Now the problem with this little mystery here is the obvious. The first working prototype of a jetpack wouldn't pop up until the 60s, almost 30 years after this account, although designs for a jetpack had been made as early as 1919, but it's not likely that a jetpack could have been created by 1936, and if it had been, it would have most likely been a secret military prototype, which begs the question, why was this man flying around in the open? which has led to the question, what exactly did this girl see that day? Well, there's not a lot of theories on this little known mystery, but some theories suggest it was actually an alien humanoid of some sort exploring the planet, while other conjectures cite the young girl somehow fell into a time slip where she saw into the future. Others, of course, cite the whole story is a hoax. July 21st, 1960 four-year-old Sharon Gallegos of Alamogordo, New Mexico, was out playing with her two cousins, who were five and eleven years old, in an alley next to her home. When a dirty old green car, believed to be an early 1950s Dodge or Plymouth, would pull up next to the children, a woman sitting inside would speak to Sharon and tell her she could take her to buy some candy and new clothing if she wanted to get in the car with them and go. Now Sharon knew about stranger danger, Actually, she knew firsthand, because the people in this car, well, this wasn't the first time they had made their presence known. In fact, this woman and the man who was driving had been stalking this poor little girl for at least four days, and more likely, a few weeks. But it would only become known in the four days prior, when Sharon and her mother had left church, and the woman in this car would then go probing other church members about Sharon and her mother. The old car would then be spotted around the neighborhood, parking near the home 
or parking at places where Sharon played. It became so bad that her mother stated Sharon's behavior had began to change. No longer was she the happy-go-lucky kid who loved to accompany her family to the grocery store. Now the little girl was visibly nervous and would refuse to go to the store. There would even be a few occasions when she would see this car out while playing and would ask a relative to come pick her up and carry her past the vehicle back indoors. And just two days prior, the woman in this vehicle would knock on a neighbor's door inquiring about Sharon's mother, her real address, and her children, specifically wondering if she had a little girl. The woman would then strangely ask if she had other children and what her financial situation was. The woman would then tell the neighbor she was only asking because they wanted to offer her mother a job. And it's worth pointing out here that their family were not well-to-do and maybe a little below middle class. Her mom worked as a maid and her father had long since left, leaving her mother, Guadalupe, to raise Sharon and her other four children alone. Which brings us back to the beginning of this story. It might be why this woman, who was described as short, wearing glasses, heavy set, and in her 30s, with dirty blonde hair, was now offering to buy Sharon some new clothes and candy. And as mentioned, Sharon, who had been putting up with this for a week, told them no, she did not want to go. The woman, refusing to be deterred, jumped out of the car, grabbed Sharon, and dragged her in. And the driver, a white man with a long nose and straight sandy hair, sped away. The other children rushed inside to tell her mother, who immediately called the police. And if you're thinking this is one of those stories that shows how slow law enforcement was back then, well, you would be wrong this time. Because within an hour, roadblocks lined up all over the Texas-New Mexico border, while they would also stop and search every car that matched the description. But sadly, it did not matter. Investigators were now brought in and were left to figure out who was behind it and where they were now. But this too ended up in failure. And sadly, news would break nine days later when a partially burned body was found in Congress, Arizona, about an eight hours drive away. Found when a man searching for rocks to put in his garden stumbled over a body. Detectives on the scene speculated that whoever was behind this had made two separate attempts to dig a grave before finally settling on this location where the remains were now found. In addition, they found tire tracks as well as two sets of footprints. One, an adult, the other, a child wearing sandals. Actually, it was a pair of adult-sized flip-flop style sandals that had been cut down to fit her. There was also a rusted and blood-stained pocket knife that was found, but it was later determined that it was probably not used because the body showed no signs of physical violence, broken bones, puncture wounds, or bruises, and a cause of death could not be determined. Furthermore, the girl's toenails and fingernails had both been painted as well as her hair had been dyed. And if we had covered this mystery prior to 2022, he would be under the unidentified people category. Because although there was the thought that this could be Sharon, no one was for sure. For one, her clothing had been changed, so there wasn't anything to identify her by. As well, as this was a long time before DNA was a thing, there was also the fact that the remains were found 500 miles away from where she was last seen. Law enforcement also suspected the victim was 7 years old, while Sharon was four. The FBI would also make footprint comparisons, which showed the prints here did not match Sharon's. So because of these reasons, investigators would rule out the girl as being Sharon, and her mother would never find out what happened to her. But of course, as you probably know by now, fast forward 60 years later, and DNA would prove that the little girl was indeed four-year-old Sharon Gallegos, and the couple that done this have never been identified and their motives aren't exactly clear either. Of course, some speculated that it was someone that knew Sharon, maybe a relative, or maybe just an acquaintance of her mother. But this seems hard to believe, as you would think someone from the family would be easily identified by her cousins, which is why the theory that it was her father, who had abandoned the children years ago, is most likely also ruled out. Another theory brought up was the abductors were transients or drifters who were just attracted to Sharon, and not necessarily in the perverse way, but possibly a couple that wanted to adopt another child and thought that she was adorable. And I say another child because witnesses did see a young boy and a little girl riding in the back with the couple, but it might explain why they were asking the family's money situation. It could be they were trying to convince themselves 
that they would be taking better care of her than her mother could. Maybe that's why they painted her nails and dyed her hair, to make her more presentable or make her feel special. However, conversely, it's also been theorized that he was an abduction for sexual purposes, which might be why Sharon had her nails painted and her hair dyed, although it could easily be argued that was all to help avoid detection by law enforcement. There's also the thought that possibly one or both abductors suffered from a mental illness. It took nearly six decades to identify Sharon, but hopefully it does not take long to identify the people behind it and their motives. March 24th, 1991, Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. Four-year-old Michael Donahue and his mother Crystal would travel to Blanchard Elementary School around 12.30 p.m. It was here that Crystal had actually came to practice on the field where she played flag football. Michael, being like a lot of kids, got bored easily and asked his mother if he could go over to the playground, which was near the field. But she tied his hood since it was windy and let him go since his dad Bruce would be there any minute, but told him to stay there until he arrived. The crystal would begin practice as Michael walked the short distance to the playground. Within a few minutes, Bruce would arrive and walk to the playground and chillingly could not find Michael. Alarmed, he ran to Crystal and the two began to notify everyone else at the practice field along with their families. In total, around 50 people began the search for Michael, yet they had no luck and the terrified parents wasted no time and immediately called the police, which led to one of the biggest investigations in Canadian history. It also picked up a ton of media coverage, mainly because of the short amount of time it took for him to vanish. We've all heard the saying, within the blink of an eye, and that could be used here, as it had not been long after Michael made his way to the field that his dad arrived. Because of that key fact, police were quick to label it as an abduction, as it was almost impossible for Michael to have gotten lost himself that quickly. As media attention grew around the case, so did the number of detectives, 15 who worked around the clock, that began receiving hundreds of tips an hour, and not just from the local area, but all over North America. The police were overwhelmed, to say the least. Detectives on the ground, meanwhile, focused a little closer to home, and they searched thoroughly. The first thing they did, naturally, was go round up all the local perverts and interrogate them, which led to nothing. They then began to question everyone they could find who had been in the area the day of the disappearance, and this time, they come up with a few credible leads, as three witnesses did place a man in his late 40s or early 50s sitting in a brown van near the playground at the time of the abduction, where at least one of these witnesses would state that they seen the man trying to lure a child into the vehicle with a McDonald's toy, which led to the witness stopping it and calling the police, who arrived too late to see that the van was gone. Another account deemed very credible came from a woman driving through the area to see a little boy running, whom she described to look a lot like Michael, when apparently an adult woman grabbed him by the arm and started walking off to an alley where a brown van was sitting, waiting with the side door open and a man standing at the driver's door. This brown van would become the focal point of the investigation, but even to this day, detectives are not for sure if the driver was involved or not. In fact, there would be other witness accounts which did not mention a van, like one who stated to have seen a, quote, yucky looking man with a blonde child in his truck on a logging road just 40 minutes away from the abduction site, and this witness said the man was acting suspiciously. The investigation over the years has been tainted by various reported sightings of Michael, many of these coming over 20 years later. In particular, quite a few alleged sightings have taken place in southern New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and the Delaware Tri-State area. One of these, Michael was said to be in the back seat of a vehicle being driven by a black male with a pockmarked face, about 5'10 and 170 pounds. However, these sightings have never been confirmed. Then, there was one disturbed man's confession that also muddied the investigation, that of a Milwaukee man named Vernon Seitz, who in his dying days confessed to a psychiatrist that he murdered a child in 1959 when he was 12 years old, which obviously wouldn't be Michael. But he also claimed to have known of another murdered child. The psychiatrist would then go tell police, and by the time they followed up, Vernon 
had already died from natural causes. But upon searching his home, they did find some disturbing items, and more importantly, a missing persons poster of Michael. Milwaukee police would then get in touch with detectives from British Columbia who would then ask Michael's mother, Crystal, had she ever heard from Vernon. Crystal would tell detectives she had never spoke to him, but she had heard of him before, and that might be because, according to members of Vernon's family, he would reach out to families of abducted children and offer to counsel them, because according to him, that murder he committed at 12 years old, well, it was because Vernon himself had been abducted and abused and was threatened that if he didn't kill this other boy, he would be killed as a result. And, as you might imagine, none of that was true. Or at least, when Milwaukee police followed it up, they found that people who knew Vernon as a child verified he had never been abducted. Furthermore, Vernon had a severe mental illness, and after looking into him more, he was eventually ruled out in Michael's abduction. And like many other cases from this time period we cover, satanic panic would also play a role. As much speculation at the time was that a satanic cult was involved in Michael's abduction. In particular, rumors swirled around the belief that the storm drains and tunnels near the abduction site was used by the cultists to take Michael without being seen. And although there was zero evidence to support this, it did hurt the investigation early on. The one constant, as far as theories go, is very few people think that Michael got lost or wandered off and succumbed to the elements. Basically, it's almost a certain he was abducted. The mystery is who. Of course, the overwhelming majority believe it was a stranger and not someone familiar with the family. The man or couple in the brown van is a definite possibility, but some believe it's not related at all, and some strongly believe it's just as possible Michael was abducted by a woman who desperately wanted a child. The saddest part about this one is police believe had this abduction occurred just a few years later, the case would have been solved and probably quickly, but it came right before video surveillance was everywhere, DNA advances, and most importantly, having a computer system to sort out the overwhelming amount of tips they received. January 4th, 2001. Washington State real estate agent Mike Emmert would begin his day like any other, leaving his home in Redmond and taking calls and showing clients potential homes. But it was this morning something truly terrifying would happen. It actually began the previous day when Mike had showed a man named Stephen a home in a quiet secluded area of Seattle. Stephen was apparently impressed by it because he asked Mike to meet him back the next day to go look again. So Mike would tell co-workers he was going to meet this weird dude who was interested in this home and Stephen, who had a limp and had to use a cane just to get around, would meet Mike at the mall around 11.30 and the two went over to the house to look again. Meanwhile, the home's current owner was at work while the house was being shown, but by 12.30, she assumed the visit would be over and she would return home to have lunch. When she pulled up, she was a little taken aback to see the front door was standing wide open. She thought that the realtor would have not been so careless as to left the door open. But as she walked in, she would be even more perplexed because she would hear the sounds of running water coming from upstairs. Of course, she was curious and so she went up to see what was going on and she spotted it, a trail of blood leading to the bathroom. I can only imagine her fear as she peeked in to see Mike's body in the bathtub. He had been brutally murdered stabbed a total of 19 times and then placed in the tub and left with the shower running. The police were called, obviously, and after a short search for Mike's car, they found it abandoned at a nearby shopping center, while his cell phone and wallet were found sitting on a payphone at a dock in Seattle. Detectives were a bit perplexed. The murder was planned meticulously, leaving nothing to chance. It was quickly determined the home was just randomly selected because of its remote location which is out of the way of nosy neighbors, and it was fairly obvious who was behind it. Stephen, the man on the cane. But how did this man on the cane, who could barely walk, overpower Mike? Well, that's just it. Detectives pretty much assumed the bum leg was all a ruse, so Mike would never feel threatened. Furthermore, police believed it was quite possible that the cane was one of those that hit a knife or small sword within it, which was used as the murder weapon. But why did this happen? Well, Mike's diamond ring and expensive watch were stolen, but that didn't really seem like the motive. In fact, 
Police believed he was killed by a professional hitman who killed Mike, dragged him to the shower, and turned it on to get rid of the trace evidence and left, which led to the question, who would hire a hitman and why? That is the mystery that has still not been answered, because as far as who the hitman was, that has been answered. In May of 2011, DNA found at and near the crime scene was finally linked to a 62-year-old man named Gary Kruger. Now Kruger, interestingly enough, was a former police officer himself, but unfortunately, he could not be interrogated because he had died several months earlier when he drowned in a lake after fleeing the scene of a home invasion. He had retired from the Seattle Police Department over 20 years earlier in 1980, citing a back injury he received during a foot pursuit. Although the most likely reason was he was being forced to retire or face termination after showing many instances of not being able to control his temper, as well as too many instances of using excessive force. He also had a bad gambling addiction. The psychiatrist for the police department would even tell senior officers Kruger was a liability. And now, he was linked to this murder, but he was also linked to three other previously unsolved murders, that of a man named Mario Vaccarino, whose murder came at the request of the mob, Jim Barry, a real estate attorney, who, not coincidentally, represented a bank involved in the collection efforts against Kruger for a delinquent loan, and Terry Dolan, a retired cop, as well as being a suspect in the disappearance of Cheryl Gross, a woman married to Gary's best friend. So while the former cop turned hitman is obviously responsible, if he did get paid to kill Mike Emmerich, the question remained, who paid him? Well, that's the thing. No one could ever come up with someone that would want to harm him. Him and his wife, Mary Beth, had a great relationship and she was ruled out early on. So were all of Mike's co-workers. Heck, even his business rivals were ruled out and none of them had any idea who would want to see him dead, which has led to a different theory that maybe it wasn't Hitman related at all. In fact, as mentioned, one of the other suspected murders Kruger was tied to was that of the real estate attorney. And Kruger himself, well, after he got out of law enforcement, he became a real estate agent for a short while. So it's possible that he had previously met Mike in that line of work, which somehow led to the murder. But considering that all of Kruger's other crimes were linked to financial motives, it doesn't seem likely that he would have targeted Emirate for any other reason, bringing the hitman theory back. Of course, some believe it was nothing more than a random killing to steal and pawn valuables from Mike. February 28, 1989. Miyakiji Village of Tamura District, Japan. A 23-year-old school teacher, Yumi Tanaka, would leave her shift at school and make her way home through the frigid winter air and back to her single-room dorm not far from the school. And at this time, the area, which was located in a mountain village, was not well developed, particularly when it came to the bathroom, which had a squatting toilet that was connected to a septic tank via a urinal pipe, and on the opposite end had a sewage outlet that occasionally would have to be manually opened and emptied, and this tank was in a U-shape, as you can see in the diagram above. And if you're wondering why I'm spending so much time describing a septic tank, well, it's because it's key to this next mystery. Because as Yumi got back to her dorm, she would go to relieve herself in the restroom, only to notice something odd. She would look down into the pit and see a shoe, which immediately struck her as odd, so much so that she ran outside and lifted the septic tank lid to see a human leg. She of course screamed and ran back to call her colleagues, who in turn called the police. They would arrive on scene shortly and found the man's body was bent up with his hands crossed over his chest, hugging a neatly folded shirt. He was lying on his back, with his face looking up into the hole from the toilet pan, as if he had been peeping. The whole scene was surreal, but got stranger. Not only was he topless, hugging his shirt, but he was also barefoot, with one of the shoes remaining in the tank and the other one missing. They would pull him out and took him for an autopsy, after cleaning him, obviously. He was then identified as a 26-year-old well-known man in the village, that of now Yuki Kano, who had been missing since the 24th and was now discovered here four days later. But the autopsy showed he had died on the 26th, 
and other than some minor scratches on his elbow and knee, there were no signs of trauma or a homicide. So detectives closed the case as an accidental death, stating that he was going to peep on Yumi and succumb to hypothermia. However, his father and people that knew him refused to believe this. They cited how reliable he was at work, as well as how sociable and kind he was, and they could not see him doing such a thing. But it wasn't just blind allegiance that led them to this conclusion. There were some things that didn't add up. First was the size of the tank, which was stated to be 14 inches in diameter, while the average shoulder width of a Japanese man is 16 inches, suggesting there was no way for him to get into that position that he got to. His father would even use the now cut out septic pipe to reenact the scene and prove that it was impossible for him to get into that pipe by himself in the posture he was found. But there were other weird things. He was freezing cold that night with eight inches of snow on, and if he was desperate enough to do this, and he actually found a way to wedge himself in, why did he take his shirt off? And even weirder, why hold on to it inside the tank? And then, what about the shoes? One was found in the tank with him near the head position, which is the one that Yumi saw, but the other was missing, and police would finally find it a good distance away in a riverbed, which made the whole thing even stranger. But we're not done with the weirdness as we come back to Yumi. The bathroom where this occurred was fairly dark, and it led many to question how she was even able to see down into the tank, which was really dark. Also, why did she run out and open the tank by herself instead of reporting what she had seen? Of course, maybe that was just because she was surprised and just on instinct ran down to check. But there is one issue here. Yumi, well, she knew now Yuki. Actually, her boyfriend was friends with him, and apparently, sometime before this, Yumi and her boyfriend had been receiving harassing phone calls and asked Naoyuki if he could help in stopping them, and he was able to set up a way to record the calls and handed the tapes off to the police. From that point, all three became good friends, and most importantly, he knew the couple's schedule well, which leads to the other issue. As mentioned, he had left on the 24th, as his father seen him leaving around 10 a.m. to go run some errands, but it's also that same day that a nationwide funeral took place for the Emperor of Japan, and the next few days was declared a national holiday with businesses and government buildings taking the days off, which included schools. And since Yumi was off for those three days, she went back to her hometown to visit family, which now Yuki knew about, and means that he got into that septic tank on the 26th, presumably waiting on Yumi, that he knew wouldn't be back for two days, yet he sat there in the freezing cold. You can see why his family was upset with law enforcement, because none of that made sense. There was also the issue that his car was found nearby with the key plugged into the keyhole and wasn't locked, suggesting that he didn't plan to stop for long and was possibly even attacked then. As far as who was responsible, assuming that it was a crime, well, there's the obvious that Yumi and her boyfriend were involved for some reason, and she knew that the body was there and fake being surprised and screamed before calling her colleagues. Of course, I could not find a motive. Another weird angle on all of this was tied to town politics. Apparently, there was a fierce argument about the Fukushima nuclear plant expanding, which was important to Naoyuki since that is where he worked. And apparently, according to this theory, after getting involved in a tough mayoral election, he stumbled up onto some corruption and was then killed. In fact, he stopped appearing in campaign speeches about midway through the election. And even weirder, his death happened right after the election. Others point to the prank caller, who, now Yuki, has stated he was close to figuring out who was behind them. Some wonder if this person could have been responsible. However, despite a petition of 4,000 signatures submitted to the police department demanding an investigation into the death be reopened, the police declined. They went with their original theory that now Yuki was just very flexible, which allowed him to climb down into the tank, but then he couldn't get back out, and sadly, succumbed to hypothermia. While some believe he may have had some kind of issue that night that led him to be stuck out in the cold, where he began to suffer hypothermia, and then crawled into the pipe for shelter. And then, with the paradoxical undressing that comes with hypothermia, he removed his shirt and shoes. And finally, some believe that
that he may have jumped in because someone was chasing him, possibly one of the political enemies he made. Neodinosaurs, or maybe known better as living dinosaurs, are a cryptid that we have discussed here a few times before. Maybe most famously is Mokele Mamembe, which supposedly lives in the jungles of Africa, specifically the Republic of the Congo and Cameroon. But what if these so-called living dinosaurs are in other places as well? That's what our next cryptid mystery entails when we take a look at the Neodinosaurs in the Amazon Basin mystery. Because going back to the late 19th century, there have been many reported sightings of them in the area, mainly Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, and Peru. Contrary to Mokele Mamembe, which has been comprised of very similar reports, sightings in the Amazon vary widely and are usually pretty generic, which is a key reason they don't have the equivalent of a Mokele Mamembe and instead just have random accounts. Although there are some traits that are reported more often than others, such as a lot of times we get the description of a large long-necked amphibian type creature followed by iguanodon types. One of the earliest reports would actually come from the Scientific American magazine in 1883, which detailed the killing of a giant lizard close to 40 feet long in Bolivia. The creature's legs were short and had claws. The legs, belly, and lower part of the throat appeared as if it was protected by a scale-type armor, while the scales on its back were thicker. The neck was long, and its belly almost dragged the ground. The tail was flattened, but most strangely, was about 13 feet from its head, were two smaller, but completely formed heads, which looked like the head of a dog. The remains were actually dried and preserved, and then sent to be studied. The professor that studied it would claim that it was a member of a critically endangered species, and cited some small earthen basins that had been used by Indians in part of Bolivia that were identical to the creature, meaning that it was well known throughout the area. Another popular report comes from October 1907, when a German traveler, Franz Hermann Schmidt, along with a Captain Rudolf Fling, were on an expedition in Peru when they would find two sets of different sized, huge tracks. It would be the next day, as they continued to trek alone, that they would hear the shriek of monkeys before calm turned to eerie silence for about 10 minutes. They would turn back to the lake and see what they called a monster. It had a head like a taper, with small eyes like an alligator. Its neck was snake-like, but rough like an alligator's side. Its body was about 8 to 9 feet thick at the shoulders, with no forelegs, only heavy clawed flippers. They would shoot at the animal, which caused it to clumsily plunge into the water and flee. They would eventually get into their boat and go upriver before they seen it again. This time, it swam under them. It was estimated to be 35 feet long, with 12 feet of that being in its head and neck. Then, there's the story by the famous Percy Fawcett himself, who reported a friend of his, whom he trusted, seen a huge reptile that looked like a brontosaurus on the border of Brazil and Bolivia. Then, there's later accounts, one from 1976, in which a longtime guide, Sebastian Bastos, would tell of his canoe being beached in the rainforest, and upon getting out and walking away, hearing a loud noise, he turned back to see a large monster tearing his boat apart. And again, the creature was described to be a dinosaur. Bastos smartly fled, looking back once to see the animal had submerged back into the river. He would then go on to say that some of his Indian friends told him these animals still live in the deep pools in the heart of the jungle. Even as late as 1995, a group of geology students in eastern Brazil allegedly glimpsed two 30-foot animals with huge bodies, 8-foot necks, and 8-foot tails in the shallows of a river. But what are people really seeing? Could it really be dinosaurs? Well, the big theory, of course, is mistaken identification of other animals or just straight-up hoaxes. There's also the possibility that it could be an unknown species of reptile. And of course, it could be a real dinosaur. November 22nd, 2005, North Augusta, South Carolina, at a local huddle house, which, if you're not aware, is pretty much like a waffle house. This one in particular, set along a busy highway full of other restaurants and tiny shopping centers, 
Now at this particular huddle house was a group of old retirees that would meet up most mornings to get coffee and chat. But this morning, only two of those men arrived, Reverend Earl Carter and 61-year-old William Powell. William and Earl had been best friends for a long time, and it was here this morning that they were exchanging stories just a few days before Thanksgiving that it would all change. It would start around 6 a.m. at a drive through restaurant just across from the Huddle House when a woman named Constance Davidson was waiting to pull forward and get her food. A strange man made his way up to her car and pulled a gun on her. He was ragged looking and demanded her car. Constance, instead of leaving her vehicle, stomped on the gas pedal and ducked low in the seat as she pulled away, hoping the maniac, if he did fire, would miss. And sure enough, she began to hear gunshots as she pulled away, and the second one would hit her. But miraculously, she lived and kept driving until she reached a gas station down the road, where she promptly called the police and an ambulance. Thankfully, Constance would be okay. But in the meantime, the gunman would move away from the drive through and go across the street to the huddle house. Around this time, Earl and William were finishing up their conversation and walking to their cars, when William would point to this young man running in their direction, and he would exclaim, that man has a gun. Just then, this guy would run up shooting, with the first shot hitting Earl in the neck, and the second shot hitting William directly in the head. He then attempted to steal one of the men's cars, but failed. So then, he ran on past both of them into another parking lot of a nearby gas station, where he would carjack a woman named Ida Heath and fled the scene. Of course, by this point, authorities were on high alert and were on their way to the scene. When they arrived to the huddle house, William was already deceased, and Earl clung to life. Amazingly, he would survive, but he had a long road to recovery, while Constance, the lady shot at the drive through would make a full recovery. But of course, capturing this man was now a top priority of South Carolina authorities. It was almost absurd, though, because this didn't happen in a secluded area in the middle of night. No, it was in the early morning rush hour on a busy highway. It was also concerning that the crime seemed totally random, which made the situation more dangerous and also worrying, as random murders are the most difficult to crack. But police had one thing to go on. That car that had been stolen from the nearby gas station, it was a 1991 Oldsmobile It was now being looked for by basically every police department in a wide area. And about six hours later, it would finally be found, and its location was odd to say the least, because it was sitting at a local hotel less than a mile away from the scene of the shooting. Even stranger, after police were tipped off to the car's presence, they arrived to find the car engine was still warm, meaning the driver had just turned it off. This, of course, set law enforcement into a panic, and they immediately searched the area around the hotel. But unfortunately, they did not find the gunman. But it led to a strange question. Had this car sat here all day? Well, police had a suspicion about that. They were fairly confident he had driven the car a good distance within that six hours, somewhere between 100 and 300 miles, probably closer to 100 miles based on gas usage, where he then came back to the crime scene. But why in the world would he take this risk? Detectives had a thought about that too. The man obviously needed a car for something, and when the first attempt at carjacking to Constance failed, he became enraged, and most likely, according to detectives, was probably high on something too, which only fueled his rage, which in turn caused him to lash out and randomly shoot William and Earl. But once he gained a hold of his anger, he settled back in on his goal, which was to steal a vehicle, and he did that. But why return? Well, that was the scariest part of all this. Detectives believed that he returned to the area because he lived there. Maybe even close to the hotel where he dropped the car off before disappearing. And as far as where he went, obviously, with North Augusta setting on the border with Georgia, it was very possible he went there. But even North Carolina was a possibility. But what would he need to go to these locations for? Was it drugs? No one was sure. Investigators were also not sure what kind of gun the man had used. Going by the descriptions given by witnesses, they were fairly confident he had used a SKS assault rifle. That gun was described by a gun store owner in the area as being an easy gun to get a hold of and was used by drug dealers as well as other criminals, such as bank robbers. They sold them often because they were cheap 
and made in China. It was also perplexing, because this was not the type of weapon you would see in crimes in a small town like North Augusta. And what would be one of the biggest crimes to ever hit this town suddenly lost steam on the investigation. There was almost zero in the way of evidence. He had lucked up and virtually missed every security camera in town, and witnesses did not get a good look at him, except for the two who had been shot and survived, and their memories were hazy at best. Even the police sketch made of the man, as you see here, is really kind of a wild guess. Others have tried to point to the theory that it was an out-of-towner, and that actually makes some sense, since this happened at a busy intersection right off a major interstate. Some have even speculated that he jumped onto the back of a tractor trailer and got out of town. But this has been almost entirely ruled out by the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, who, with the assistance from the FBI, created a psychological profile which stated the gunman most likely lived in, worked by, or frequented the area where the shooting took place, which explains how he got in and out of the area twice without anyone noticing. He was also believed to have an explosive temper and most likely had a criminal history related to domestic violence, assault, and a drug offense. In the nearly two decades since, police have cleared at least 12 different suspects and traveled from as far away as Delaware to the Midwest, yet seemingly are no closer to making an arrest. But it is worth noting that they did recover a DNA sample which they believe belongs to the killer. It has not scored a hit in the national database yet, but with the advances in familial testing, one has to think this guy will be identified sooner rather than later. It's that time again. That's right. It's time for the Small Mystery Roundup. If you have never seen videos on this channel before, this next little segment is where I put the mysteries that, for various reasons, do not warrant a full segment on their own. So I do a little road up bit for all of them together. Starting with Man in the Plastic Bag. This one is an unidentified individual mystery that spawned on the website Quora when a man named Pedro would claim him and a friend encountered a man wearing only boxer shorts and a plastic bag on his head. They took pictures of him but only uploaded the one and supposedly they tried to talk to him only to see him walk away into the woods. And that's basically it which is not much of a mystery. Pedro didn't even give a city, although he did state it happened in California. He also gave no date when it happened, but since he mentioned taking pictures with his cell phone, it must have been in the recent past. But the theories were, it was some kind of cryptid never seen before, or a human attempting to commit suicide, a hoax, mental illness, or drugs. To me, it seems like it was put on the iceberg as a joke. Next, we have neutral monism, which is another one of those tricky philosophical concepts. Basically, it states that everything in the universe, from thoughts, feelings, to physical items, such as your clothes and cell phone, are all made up of the same thing. These things, or this stuff, is neither purely mental or purely physical, but something in between, hence the word neutral. So instead of saying everything really comes from the mind, or everything is physical, neutral monism suggests there's some kind of substance that creates both the physical and mental aspects of reality. Essentially, everything in the universe comes from the same source, whether that's thoughts or things. Next is the poopers. Dear Lord, there's always poopers. First was the Ohio serial pooper, who, between 2012 and 2015, would, for some bizarre reason, start taking dumps on cars at least 19 of them, in Akron, Ohio. And he didn't just do it on the bumper or hood. He actually climbed up onto the top of cars and would poop in through the sunroofs, adding insult to injury. Although, if you had your car doors unlocked, he would just go inside. Sometimes, he would get creative and put it on the windshield, gas tank covering, mirrors, windows, or handles on the car. He also released his bowels on children's toys left in front yards. He only stopped once his face got caught on hidden camera and was released to the public. This one, crazy enough, actually has two viable theories. The first one was that it was a homeless man, but the interesting one was that it was a man named David Ware, a 56-year-old firefighter. He looked very similar to the man in the photo, and maybe most convincing, the day the local newspaper published the photo, Ware would kill his wife and himself. Next we have the serial defecator of West Side Road. 
whose pooping notoriety is nowhere near the level of the Ohio serial pooper. Instead, this man would hit the West Side Road neighborhood in Conway, New Hampshire in 2017, where he would go to the end of residence driveways and let go. Apparently, this was the only street in town that he hit up. However, in this case, there was no security cam photos to even try and identify him. Next, we move to a peculiar story that you would often find on the Unsolved Mysteries television show back in the day. In this one, called Saviors of Doris Smith, we would find the story of a deputy sheriff from Miller County, Missouri, named Doris Smith. On September 17, 1995, she was transporting a female prisoner in her squad car, when somehow, the prisoner broke loose in the vehicle and began attacking Doris, who, obviously in the middle of driving, could not fight back. The prisoner then began reaching for her gun, and she fought hard to prevent it, and luckily, two good Samaritans happened to be driving by and seen all the commotion. They rushed to the scene and subdued the prisoner until Doris could lock her up again. These men left before she could thank them, though. There was even a photo taken of their vehicle, which had been pulling a boat, but in spite of this appearing on the popular TV show, and in spite of it happening in a very small town, these men were never identified and Doris never got to thank them. Next, we have the Screamer Flip Note, which is again, one of those Screamer videos that has been lost. In this one, the video starts with an animation that is a parody of the What Is Love meme, while the song Baby by Justin Bieber plays. After eight seconds of this, a black shaking picture of a man with no eyes appears alongside a very loud scream, followed by a troll face that reads, Problem? Question mark. This, of course, is a lost media mystery. Finally, we have two missing person cases, which I rarely skip over. The first one was that of Paula Jean Weldon. She was an 18-year-old sophomore college student in North Bennington, Vermont, who, in 1946, went on what was supposed to be a small hike on the Long Trail, which is located around Glastonbury Mountain, but she never returned. An extensive search of the area was conducted, and not one clue ever surfaced, along with a hefty reward posted for anyone who had information and no tips ever came forward. But the reason I didn't cover it in this one is I have basically already covered it before. In episode 19 of the Mega Unsolved series, we took a look at the Bennington Triangle, which is supposed to be this weird area in southwest Vermont where all these strange disappearances took place between 1945 and 1950. Paula's case was the most famous of these, hence I already covered it pretty well. Likewise, it's the case of Robert Allen, whom we briefly discussed back on part 14 of the Mega series, and I mean very briefly. In that one, we named a psychopath piece of trash named Marvin Gabrion, who sexually assaulted an 18-year-old Rachel Timmerman on August 7, 1996, in Cedar Springs, Michigan. He would also violently beat her. However, she was afraid to press charges because he threatened to kill her and her baby, but she did eventually get brave enough to go report him and he was finally arrested. Her life would be racked with anxiety over the months leading up to the trial, although she did try to calm down some, even though he kept sending her threats. That's when a man she thought was kind, John Weeks, offered to take her out on a date and encouraged her to bring her baby Shannon along. She agreed and never returned. And long story short, it was later found that Rachel had been tied up and tossed into a lake while still alive and drowned. And baby Shannon was never found. On top of that, John Weeks, who was an acquaintance of Marvin and was most likely in on the setup to bring Rachel back to him, also vanished and is presumed to have been murdered by Marvin, which is why we covered him early on in this iceberg. Not only that, but one of the men that had been riding with Marvin the night that he sexually assaulted Rachel had agreed to testify against him. His name was Wayne Davis and he too vanished, presumed again to have been murdered by Marvin. But I had to tell you that whole backstory to bring you back to the mystery in question, which is that of Robert Allen. He was a mentally ill transient who vanished in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 1995. The reason it connects here is Marvin Gabrion was known to numerous people as Robert Allen, and that's because he stole Robert's identity after Robert vanished, suggesting that he too was killed by Marvin. However, because Robert was a transient, there's very little about him or his disappearance publicly available. Now, let's get back to the program.
So far on this massive iceberg, we have discussed numerous cryptids that are of the so-called fearsome critter variety, which is essentially creatures that were first documented by some of the earliest people to see the interior of America, usually lumberjacks. That's where we find this next cryptid, the oomph. It's said to be about the size of a dog, but it is a cross between a big lizard and a toe with long claws and sharp spikes along its back, as well as having big spots all over its body. Its diet is said to be that of eggs found in bird nests that when it devours them, makes a noise deep down in its throat that sounds like Ooh. Allegedly, the oomph had a bounty on it, which encouraged all early settlers to kill it on sight because they devoured up eggs and could be a danger to livestock. There are supposed to be variations of this creature too, such as the aquatic desert one, which is a cat-sized aquatic reptile that lives in the desert with webbed feet and six large fangs. And instead of having spots, it is covered with warts. And instead of eating eggs, its diet is water beetles and smoked salmon, which I guess means that these cryptids were known to steal food from the earliest settlers in the region. Then there was that of the forest oomph, which would supposedly use the bony spines on its back to act as a buzz saw, where it would then cut trees down and devour the sawdust. The lesser two known of the variety are that of the rock one, which were supposedly spotted by geologists on rainy nights. They allegedly lived on lava and rocks and looked more like a dinosaur, and there's hardly any info about the other one, the marsh oomph. Of course, the most likely theory is it was completely made up by loggers and then towed to new settlers who entered the area and had no idea about the local wildlife. On a cold rainy night on October 22nd of 1984, Worcester, Massachusetts, 17-year-old Patricia Gonya would call her mom to let her know she would be arriving home a little bit later as she was still hanging out at her boyfriend's waiting on his older brother to get home so he could give her a ride back. But her boyfriend's brother was busy that night as well, and it would be another 30 minutes before he would be able to take Patricia back home. So Patricia, instead of waiting, decided to go ahead and take the short bus trip home, where it would drop her off at a stop around 11.15 p.m., about a three to four minute walk from her home. The next morning, Patricia's mother would awake to go to her room to check on her, and shockingly realized Patricia was not home. She would first call her boyfriend, who confirmed she had left the night before on the bus. He tried to reassure her mother and told her she probably went on a morning run, but Patricia's mother was not so sure. And she, along with Patricia's brothers and some neighbors and friends, would begin to canvass the neighborhood, and they would soon be joined by her boyfriend. After a cursory search for her, they did find Patricia's purse not far from a local factory, and they immediately called the police, who in turn, would start their own search. Around 12.45 p.m., this one police officer would find and follow a 300-foot trail of Patricia's discarded items, which included a bloody jacket. And at the end of this trail, he finally found her. She was nude and face down in the window well of a factory about two miles from the bus stop. She had been sexually assaulted and then bludgeoned to death as her skull had been fractured. Detectives soon discovered the attack had occurred on a set of railroad tracks, which was just two blocks from her home, and she was then dragged back to the factory. Unfortunately, due to the heavy rain the night before, some evidence had been washed away. Even worse was another murder that was not connected to Patricia's had just taken place two days earlier, and the two investigations spread the detectives thin. Still, investigators would do what they could, and they went into the case believing that the murderer was someone known to Patricia. Detectives would begin to run down leads and interviewed over 100 people and quickly found at least one witness who seen a man wearing a dark colored zip up jacket. He was white, around six foot tall, and he might have wore a hat and glasses and apparently had been trailing Patricia about 50 feet behind her. And at some point on her way home, Patricia would decide to take a shortcut to get there, which ran by these railroad tracks. Now, did she do this because it was raining or because this guy was trailing her? No one can be sure. Regardless, those tracks were known in town as an area where you could take a shortcut, which is what many of the teenagers did, and most likely, the Predator knew this. The case would go cold quickly though, and had very little movement for years, but in 2009, detectives, armed with new DNA techniques, would send off swabs of biological evidence 
to a DNA testing laboratory, hoping they could blow the case wide open. But, because the evidence wasn't stored properly during that time frame, since no one really knew how to handle DNA evidence then, nothing helpful was found. They did find a sub-fragment of DNA that did not belong to either Patricia or her boyfriend, but it was not enough to make a DNA profile. What's interesting in this one is the possibility that a serial killer was involved, as there were two other unsolved murders that were semi-local and are very similar. First was that of Holly Pironin, who was abducted from Sturbridge in 1993, about a 30-minute drive from Worcester. She would later be found murdered, and although the age range doesn't exactly fit, some believe the two could be connected. Then there's the case of Molly Bish, a 16-year-old abducted in Warren in 2000, about a 45-minute drive from Worcester, as she would also be found murdered. No one is for sure if any of these cases are linked, or if Holly and Molly's are connected, while Patricia's was random. As far as suspects go, I was only able to find some conjecture about one. There was a man named Peter Mason, who murdered two women in Massachusetts in 1981, and was then arrested for it several years later. He would have been 35 at the time of Patricia's murder, but there is little in the way of details about this individual and his crimes, and I'm not sure if he was ever seriously considered. This case has very little publicly available. But since police do hold on to sub-fragments of DNA, there's the hope that one day it could lead to an arrest. Nineteen sixty-three, the height of the Cold War. The United States, who was locked in an ideological battle with the Soviet Union, would find itself going the extra mile when it came to making alliances and doing favors for other countries who could help keep the battle balanced. And it's here we would find that taking place as JFK would finally give in to Pakistan President Ayub Khan's request to lease them a fast attack submarine. The sub which had been launched in 1944 and had served the U.S. Navy since, was now being handed over to Pakistan on a four-year lease, who obviously had beef with India, who was unsurprisingly allied with the Soviet Union. The sub was armed with 14 torpedoes and had the capability to lay mines, although naval historians have pointed out that the sub was pretty old and basically only used for training purposes in the years before it was sold to Pakistan. Nevertheless, it was the first navy in South Asia to have a submarine, which scared India. And just two years later, when the Indo-Pakistan War of 1965 began, he would be the only submarine in the entire war. However, this was short-lived. Actually, it only lasted a month. But the sub would remain with the Pakistan Navy, and they would even get a renewed lease from the U.S. to keep it longer. And it would be caught into action just six years later, in 1971, when the Third India-Pakistan War would start. But this is not a 20th century war channel. We're here to discuss a mystery, and that mystery would pop up in this war. It's August of that year, India would transfer their aircraft carrier to the Eastern Naval Command, which in turn forced the Pakistan Navy to adjust the submarine's operations. Now before this war, Pakistan had looked at ways to strengthen its naval defense, but none of these were real feasible, and they were just at a disadvantage, which they knew. It only got worse for Pakistan when a lot of their naval officers defected to India. And now with India advancing on three fronts, the pressure was up and the government insisted the sub should be moved to the east to help reinforce the area, which the leaders of the navy objected to this idea because it was highly dangerous. And basically, getting this outdated submarine behind enemy lines was impossible. But once the war seemed inevitable, the navy had no choice but to move it where it was then given the order to sink India's aircraft carrier and to lay mines on India's eastern seaboard. The brave men would disembark on November 14th and make their way around the Indian Peninsula. Two days later, the commander would record they were about 250 miles off the coast of Bombay. A few days after this, on the 23rd, the sub would set off to Chennai, where the carrier was said to be stationed. However, the old submarine was actually late by 10 days, and that carrier was long gone. So the captain at this point just kind of gave up hunting it and decided to go lay mines off of India's coast, which seemed much easier. So we move forward now to November 26th, and it was this day the sub was expected to report back into Navy headquarters with an update, but it didn't. The headquarters would begin reaching out over and over, but there was no reply from the sub. 
The worry began to grow among the junior officers, although senior officers kept insisting there could be many reasons the sub was not communicating, and that there was no need to worry yet. But there was reason to worry, because the sub would never surface and all 93 men on board were lost. And to this day, there's been a heated debate over what exactly happened, because it would actually be about two weeks later, on December 9th, that the Indian Navy had planned to make a statement about the sub. Although, Pakistan had a good idea what this statement was going to be, because on December 3rd, their intelligence intercepted a message from Indian headquarters which stated the Ghazi had been sunk. According to India's version of events, it all started when their navy intercepted a signal from the sub going back to the Pakistan military officials asking about a lubrication oil, a very specific type of oil used only by subs and minesweepers. With this intel, a destroyer would go out to an area where the sub had allegedly been spotted and began to hunt it. And on December 3rd, around midnight, a lookout would spot a breaker on the water, and it's here the ship began to drop depth charges and heard powerful explosions from underneath. They surveyed the area a little longer, and although they never seen any debris, they were sure the sub was sunk. Indian intelligence would also state that they knew the sub would have to come to the area, so they baited Pakistan with misinformation that claimed the aircraft carrier would be in the area. The Indian government would then also claim that they sent their own sub down to verify that Ghazi had been destroyed, as well as later on, building a memorial at sea to the victims. However, this would all become contested after the war, with at least one senior Indian naval officer confirming the explosion they heard actually occurred at the beach and nothing exploded under the water. Then, a retired Vice Admiral, G. M. Hernanandani, would spend a long time documenting an exhaustive account of the sinking of Ghazi. In his book, he would conclude that although a clock from Ghazi had been recovered, and although an explosion was heard, the submarine actually suffered an internal explosion. The reason why was unknown. Others disputed this claim, and one senior naval officer stated that it was common practice in narrow channels during a war to throw depth charges around them to deter submarines, and that one of these probably accidentally hit Ghazi, and was just unknown to the Indian military for days until a life jacket was recovered. By 2003, though, the Indian Navy sent down divers to further investigate, and it was officially found that the sub indeed suffered an internal explosion which then blew up the mines and torpedoes, perhaps from a buildup of hydrogen gas that occurred while its batteries were being charged. Pakistan, on the other hand, maintained that Ghazi sank after one of the mines it was laying accidentally detonated. However, two decades later, in the 90s, they would instead cite computer problems and electromechanical failures, although they again backtracked on this and offered up new theories, such as the buildup of hydrogen gas that led to an explosion, or because of the type of torpedoes, which were controversial in their own right, as they were plagued with problems and known to go in a circle and come back and hit the ship that fired it. Another theory proposed by independent investigators is that one of the depth charges did not cause external damage to the sub, but instead, the shock waves from it caused a mine or torpedo to explode on board. While another theory cited the inexperienced crew on board who had no experience laying mines. Furthermore, they had 12 extra personnel on board which could have put a strain on its capabilities. Still, to this day, there is no theory that is satisfactory to all parties. July 2nd, 1966, 21-year-old Ann Miller would drive over and pick up 19-year-old Patricia Blau around 8 a.m. before the two departed together to go pick up 19-year-old Renee Brohl on the west side of Chicago. Patricia and Renee had became friends in school and remained so afterwards, still doing things together when possible, while Ann and Patricia had met at a horse stable. As all three women loved horses, it was this July 4th weekend they intended to celebrate by hanging out at a park. They would first stop at a store to pick up some suntan lotion before arriving at the Indiana Dune State Park around 10 a.m. where they left their car in a parking lot about 100 yards away from the shores of Lake Michigan. It would be here the girls would be seen sunbathing, swimming, and just hanging around chatting. The girls were supposed to return to their respective homes early that evening as Renee wanted to be back in time to cook dinner for her husband. 
but by late that evening, a couple who had been on the beach earlier and noticed the three young ladies would spot their belongings just sitting around on the beach with none of the girls around. They found it alarming and would go report it to a ranger, but that wasn't all they had reported. Apparently earlier, around noon, this same couple would spot the three women entering the lake together and not long after, talking to a man on a 15-foot white boat that had a blue interior. The ranger also found this mysterious, and he would go over to check out the spot where the girls had been laying. He found a beach towel, shorts, blouse, cigarettes, suntan lotion, and a purse containing around 55 bucks in checks, which all belonged to Renee. While he also seen Patricia's yellow robe, sunglasses, towel, radio, and wallet containing $5, as well as Anne's denim shorts, a polo shirt, shoes, white bathing cap, comb, and water bottle. The ranger would collect all the women's belongings and take them to the park's office and then not follow up. It would actually be two days later when Patricia's father would call to see if anyone had seen the three women. The rangers realized they had a problem. And it wasn't long after this that the rangers soon learned that a missing persons report had been filed by all three of the ladies' families. So now, the rangers began their investigation and soon found the car the women had traveled over in where it still sat in the same spot in the parking lot. It also contained their clothing and other personal effects. It was at this point that the rangers contacted other law enforcement as well as the Coast Guard. And three days after they initially went missing, the official search would begin, which was an awful start and bad enough on its own, but it got worse because witnesses kept coming forward with accounts that just contradicted each other, one after the other. Investigators quickly done away with these tips and went by the original report that the three had spoke to a man on the boat and then they boarded and disappeared. They would then begin to search over a six mile stretch of beach west of the park while more and more witnesses kept coming forward to state that they had seen the women get onto the boat. And these witnesses had more information. They described the man as being in his early 20s with a tan complexion and dark wavy hair and was wearing a beach jacket. Thankfully, a critical piece of evidence would come in it just so happened a visitor at the park had been filming home movies that day and brought the video to investigators. After reviewing the footage, detectives immediately narrowed it down to two different boats, but it was still a bit confusing. First, there was the smaller boat, which was about 17 feet long and was operated by a man that fit the description of the unidentified man they had been talking to, as well as the boat had three women on it that fit the description of the three missing women. However, the second boat was much larger, around 27 feet, and was actually a cabin cruiser, and it wasn't seen until 3 p.m., three hours after the women allegedly boarded the smaller vessel. And on this larger boat was three men that were again accompanied by three women. Detectives came up with the theory that the first man had dropped them off of the smaller boat while he drove back to pick up two male friends and brought them back on the cabin cruiser, where they then picked up the three girls. But it gets more confusing because during that time, while the three girls are waiting for them to return, they were observed walking around the beach as well as stopping to eat. It was at this point they were approached by another man who then accompanied them to the cabin cruiser. Since there appeared to be no malice in the film, detectives began to speculate that maybe the women had left on their own, all three of them. In fact, they did find a note from Renee that had been wrote to her husband of 15 months, which implied she wanted to leave the relationship due to him spending all his free time with friends and working on cars. However, he obviously disputed this and her own family came to his side, citing she wrote the letter in a moment of anger and changed her mind and just held on to the note. But another tip came in when a friend of Patricia's told police that Patricia had told her she was going to stage her own disappearance and did not want to ever be found. However, like a lot of theories in this one, they could find no evidence to substantiate it. That's when they would begin to consider their connection to horses, which of course, like anything that involves quite a bit of money, there are sometimes connections to the criminal underworld. In fact, both Anne and Patricia were associated with men who had criminal backgrounds in the horse world. And Patricia in particular had told people she was having problems with the horse syndicate people after she showed up with a facial injury that looked to have been caused by a fist just three months earlier. One of the leads uncovered here went back to the stable where the three women frequented. It was owned by a man named George Jane, 
a prominent horse dealer. He had been in a bitter dispute with his stepbrother Silas over some horse dealing around that time, and Silas would attempt to kill him with a car bomb. And a young woman named Cheryl Ann Rude, who was associated with George and the horse market, would unfortunately be the one killed by the bomb after she attempted to move George's car for him. And to bring it back to our mystery, detectives looked at the possibility that one or all of the girls may have witnessed this bomb being planted the year before and could serve as a witness at the trial, which would match up with Patricia telling others that she had issues with the horse syndicate. And both George and Silas's phone numbers were found in the belongings of at least one of the women. Furthermore, Silas did tell a sheriff that three bodies had been buried under his residence, but before law enforcement had a chance to dig under the home, the sheriff was killed in an accident. And for whatever reason, the lead was never followed up on by any other law enforcement. Of course, at the end of the day, none of these leads could ever be proven. So detectives looked at the other possibility, that it was an accident, that was then covered up by the men aboard the ship. But the problem with this was, Patricia was an excellent swimmer, who had swam up to 30 miles previously, while Anne was thought to be almost as good, if not as good as Patricia, and Renee was a fair swimmer. Because of this, drowning was deemed one of the lesser possibilities. Another wild theory concerned that of a man named Ralph Largo Jr., who lived with his aunt and uncle in Gary, Indiana, and those two performed illegal abortions. And the theory states that Anne, who had told her friends she was three months pregnant before all this happened, may have been seeking one, as well as Patricia, who may have also been pregnant, although that one's less sure. And it's worth noting, both of the men Anne and Patricia were seeing were married, but it's thought that the three entered the boat, which would then go several miles offshore to perform the abortions, and then something went wrong and the women were dumped into the lake. However, that might be a stretch because, again, no one is even sure if Patricia was pregnant, and there is no suspicion that Renee was, or that she would even want an abortion since she was married. Others have brought up the possibility of serial killer Oba Chandler, who lured a woman and her two daughters onto his boat in 1989 before murdering them. And he would have been right around 20 years old at the time these three women vanished. And although the murders took place in Florida, he did have a history of criminal behavior and violence in Ohio as well. However, him being a suspect is just speculative. Sticking with serial killers is the theory that Richard Speck, a convicted killer who killed eight student nurses on July 13th and 14th of 1966, which obviously fits the year and happened reasonably close to the disappearance of these three. Of course, there's no proof for this one either. Others speak to more non-violent theories, such as sinkholes that have been known to pop up in the dunes, although no remains were found if that was the case. Others cite the reliability of the witnesses who claimed to have seen them boarding the boat. If they were wrong, then that means numerous other possibilities got tossed aside. In the decades since, there have been numerous sightings of the three women, and of course, none of these were ever confirmed. The boats and men, however, have never been spotted again, or at least have never been identified. Although debris from what appeared to be a boat wreck was discovered shortly after this, but since no boat wrecks had been reported, no one could be sure that it was connected or if it was even a wreck. In 2006, 20-year-old Satara Stratton would pursue her dream that is shared by many young people, that of being a big-time actress or director in Hollywood. The Tennessee native had moved to New York two years prior where she took theater lessons at the American Musical and Dramatic Academy. It was here she would appear in several commercials, music videos, and worked on Broadway. But now she was taking her chances in California, where she would have some modest success appearing in numerous independent films. But a couple years later, in 2010, her Hollywood dreams would take a dark turn, when she would be hospitalized for two weeks after a robbery outside of a bank. This period of downtime would cause her to lose her job as well as missing a semester of school. This then began a spiral of bad luck, and she soon couldn't make her share of rent and had to move out. It was then she began crashing at different friends' places. One of these so-called friends was a man named Paul Constantine Escu, whom she had met on a movie set. Paul was on drugs, and soon Satara was too, and she became addicted. However, she would rebound 
and entered detox the following summer in 2011. However, by that November, things would get dark again because on the 22nd of that month, her mother would call to check on her and she would ask her to drive over and check on her grandmother whose health was getting bad and Satara agreed to it. But she never made it to her grandmother's and would not be heard from for a while. Her mom, understandably worried, would call the LAPD a month later after not being able to get into contact with her. And this is the part of the story where everything gets weird, as LA detectives would investigate and would tell her mother that Satara was a voluntarily missing adult, which her mother flatly disputed, claiming she knew she was being held by Paul. Detectives, for their credit, began to look for him, as they wanted to find out if he might know where she was since he was the last person to see her, although they did not accuse him of being responsible for her disappearance, if she had disappeared. In fact, there had been several witnesses that had seen her around Santa Monica Boulevard and along the Hollywood Boulevard corridor, and on March 15, 2012, it was confirmed. Satara was alive, but the details were only getting stranger because she was actually found at a hospital where she was treated for numerous injuries. Clumps of her hair had been pulled from her head, and then there were cigarette burns all over her arms and shins, as well as marks that had been made by fingernails digging into her arms. She would tell detectives she had been held captive at Paul's place, where she had been tortured for four and a half months, and he had kept her regularly injected with drugs. It was only after pressure from the police did he let her go to the hospital. Well, that, and they were running out of money and couldn't afford to keep bouncing around at hotels. She would claim that he abducted her after telling her he would take her to her grandmother's. But exactly who was this Paul? Well, for starters, he was a registered sex offender on parole and coincidentally had been busted on the television show to catch a predator. But he was now being arrested for a narcotics violation. Detectives began to look into foul play and the circumstances around Satara's disappearance and press no charges against Paul, leaving many to wonder to this day what exactly happened. As you might have guessed, it's left many with the theory that Satara made the whole thing up. But why? That is a mystery to itself. Although, maybe it's because she wanted to hide from her mother how bad things were. However, this is something her mother had dismissed since the initial investigation. Her story was that a sexual predator, Paul, had restrained and kept her daughter locked up in an apartment for nearly five months, injecting her with drugs. She also claimed Satara had told her she had been kept in a little cut-out hole in the home where she was hidden. Her mother would claim that the LA authorities were attempting to sweep the whole thing under the rug because the case was starting to gain national attention. She would even state that when Satara had first moved in with Paul, he called her mother to let her know he planned on injecting her with heroin. But the LAPD, well, they would dispute this as they had some evidence to the contrary, mainly that of arrest, as Satara had been arrested on several occasions, usually for possession of narcotics, and the mugshot showed a spiral out of control. They would even tell her mother it was very uncommon for a victim to be found alive three months after being abducted. There was also the fact that Satara was in a rehab facility when Paul picked her up allegedly to take her to her grandmother's. It was only then that he allegedly kept her hid away for four months, torturing her. And if we go back even further, she had already been in rehab once before, where again, Paul signed her out and had let her stay with him for four days before family and friends found her and put her back in rehab. Satara would overdose and die on February 4th, 2017, and Paul would never be arrested for any of the crimes that Satara or her mother accused him of, leaving a debate today, did this man really do all that he was accused of, or was Satara asking him to come get her out of rehab and then hid from the police and her family for four months, all the while trying to keep the truth hidden from her mother? You can let me know in the comment section below what you believe. August 13th, 1997, shock jock Howard Stern would get a phone call that left him and his audience a bit uneasy when a man named Clay would call in with a dark, interesting claim. According to him, Clay, which was undoubtedly a fake name, would tell Howard he was a serial killer, responsible for 12 murders of sex workers in New Orleans. Howard, 
who was definitely a very controversial person at the time, would actually go along and hit this man with question after question, pumping him to give up more information about himself. In hindsight, for a man like Stern, who a lot of the public had contempt for, this was seen as admirable, trying to coax out enough details from the man in hopes that someone could identify him. Because of this, we know that the man was white, had no tattoos, used a hammer for most of his murders, and he usually committed such acts on the side of the road. Now after Howard talked to the man for a while, he would eventually get off the phone, but not before Howard tried to convince him to turn himself in, and that was pretty much it. Although, word did come out the next day that the FBI came by to talk to Howard, who then turned the tape of the recorded call over to them, and Howard would never mention it again. Now if you know anything about Howard Stern's show, then you will know that the program received numerous calls over the years from people claiming to have done terrible things. In fact, it's alleged that Stern himself was behind a lot of these calls to boost ratings. So the serial killer call is often written off as nothing more than a prank by Stern. However, there's one little catch here, because there was a serial killer operating in New Orleans in this time period, that of the Storyville Slayer, although it's believed this man killed at least 24 different women instead of the 12 that the caller claimed. But the similarities didn't stop there. In the investigation into the Storyville slaying, police would eventually arrest two different suspects. One was an African-American corrupt police officer named Victor Gant, who was arrested in a domestic dispute with a woman he had met during the time he had patrolled the red light districts, and her name was Sharon Robinson. But before Sharon could testify against him and her friend, the only other witness, were both found dead. However, DNA testing was inconclusive and Gant was released. But that brings us to the next suspect, a white man named Russell Elwood, who first came onto detectives' radars in 1994 and was finally charged and convicted of the murder of at least one of these women, that of Cheryl Lewis. Now I had to fill you in on that because not only did this caller identify himself as a white man that targeted black prostitutes or mixed race ones, like the Storyville Slayer did, when Howard asked the caller if he had any close calls with the police, he would laugh and say no, that they actually arrested the wrong man, a black police officer, just like the Storyville Slayer, leading many to believe that this caller was actually Russell Elwood. But there's just one problem with that. This phone call happened on August 13th, and Elwood had been arrested nine days earlier on August 4th for buying cocaine off of an undercover cop. So unless he called from jail to tell Howard all this in an interview that lasted over 15 minutes, it wasn't him. I also know phone calls are recorded in prison, but I'm not sure they are in the county jail where Elwood was. There's also the fact that Clay mentioned having a fiance and children and had minimal drug use, unlike Elwood. And Cheryl Lewis, who Elwood was ultimately convicted of murdering, well, she was a nurse, not a sex worker. So I think we can safely rule him out. But that has left the door open for the possibility that it was another serial killer. In fact, law enforcement believe that the Storyville slayings were committed by multiple killers, meaning this phone call could still be legit. For the people who believe it was the real killer, they point out the caller's knowledge of specific details and crimes in New Orleans that is at least a little suspicious. There's also the fact that law enforcement have never been able to conclusively say that the phone call was a hoax. His demeanor also came off like a genuine psychopath. However, for the doubters, it's often brought up that the whole weird saga is never mentioned again, although it's possible law enforcement just told Howard to not discuss it anymore. And secondly is the many awkward pauses by the man, which seems to indicate he was thinking up a replies on the spot, like he's making up the story as he goes. Although, it could be argued he's taking these long pauses to carefully avoid saying anything that could get him busted. But that brings up another interesting point. About halfway through the call, Howard and Robin seem to be leading him by giving him simple yes or no questions instead of asking him for descriptive answers. Finally is the fact that in the years that followed, law enforcement questioned the credibility of the call. So I ask you, hoax or real? Let me know in the comment section below. That brings us to the end of the Unsolved Mystery Mega Iceberg Explained, Part 23. We are now two-thirds of the way through Layer 8. I hope you all enjoyed. Goodbye and good night.